morning, everybody, and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. So I got good news, good news, and bad news. Let's start with the good news first, and then we'll go to the other good news. Okay, for the first good news, we have a contest that we're running here. Um, this is a contest for three card game bundles. Now, this particular contest, um, and a lot of times people ask why contests are available where they are, and a lot of time it has to do with legal and rights and where they can be sent to. This one is for USA only, um, but you'll win the Mind, the Mind Extreme, Quinto, and the game Quick and Easy. Four small card games, all small card games from Pandasaurus. In the back corner you can see one of their upcoming games, the, well it's called the game Face to Face. But that's not one of, that's not one of these four games, but they make these small little card games. They're really fun, the Mind very popular. And if you think the mind is fun, the mind extreme takes it to another level. And then Quinto is kind of a roll and write style game. And the game Quick and Easy is like the game, but faster. Um, so if you want to enter this contest, all you have to do is email us at contest at dicetower.com. In the subject line, put the word silence. Uh, because you have to be quiet when you're playing at least the mind. And I want to know what language were these card games originally published in? That's the question you have to answer. What language were they originally published in? I'll give you some narrowing it down. It was not in Esperanto. All right, so that, or Pig Latin. Or, I'll pick a real language. It was not originally in Finnish. So I just narrowed it down a bit for you. So we'll get, three people will win that contest. So there you go. All right, second good news is hopefully, and I'm always hesitant to talk about this stuff until everything is done, but we found a studio um, and I will be closing on that studio tomorrow. Hopefully, you know, I mean, everything's been done and checked and all, but what does that mean though? That leads us to the bad news in a sense, whatever the news might be. This is the last board game breakfast on a Monday you're going to see for probably three weeks. The next two weeks. So this week we're going to do a full week of productions and I'll talk about that later in the productions part of our, of our uh, board game breakfast. But then the two weeks after that, we're shutting everything down because we have to move. And there's a, it's a humongous process, not just of us moving, but building the new studios, taking wires down, putting wires up, moving the library in. Now, I'm going to try to take as much video of the process as I possibly can um, so that when we're done, we'll show you what it looked like and we'll show this studio compared to the, to the new one. Um, and hopefully that will be some interesting stuff. And we're going to be down. Now, the good news is we have a backlog of, you know, I don't know, 10,000 videos for you to watch. So enjoy those while we're doing that. Um, but so we're excited about that. And it's going to mess with the schedule a bit. But hopefully, like I said, we'll all survive till we get to the other side of this. And the other side will be better. So, um, all right. So that's the good, good bad news. Let's get to some contributors. Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Ripple University and the Dice Tower. So we spoke about this last week and now I'll ask you, is there any board game that you've played that's given you a, a big interest in what that game was based on outside the board gaming world? Last time we spoke about pinball and this time it is Anno 1800. So, I played the board game first. It's designed by Martin Wallace. We have the German edition here, by, by the way. And because of this, I really like it. It's my top 10 game of 2020. Because of this, I'm playing the PC game. I haven't played the PC game. I do like civilization game though. So, it doesn't take too much to convince me to, oh, what is this? And then I look at it, oh, I can see a lot of resemblance on the board game and the PC game. So have you, you know, done anything like this? So you've, you know, you've got the board game first, you play the board game first, and then maybe you watch the movie or play the video games that are based on the board game. Or read the book. Oh yeah, there's the book as well. Uh, like um, Red Rising, I think. It is based on the book. Yeah. So have you done it? Let us know in the comment sections below. We just really curious here what if this is the only uh, we are the only one or I'm sure there are other people there like that too. But that's it. We are Meeple University on YouTube and also on the Dice Tower. See you next time. Bye. Hey everybody, Ron here. I'm back with another affordable board game. Today I'm gonna to talk about 
Tiny Epic Quest. Tiny Epic Quest is a game by Scott Alms, published by Gambling Games. It plays one to four players, ages 14 and up, 30 to 60 minutes, with a $25 MSRP. Take your band of elf heroes on an epic adventure to complete quests, learn dangerous magic, and vanquish goblins. To set up, each player grabs their meeples, tokens, character cards, and a set of legendary items and sets them up. Set up the magic card and add each player's spell token on the card. Create the land map by laying out a cross of five cards to each of the four castle cards, then the rest of the cards. Place the hero meeples on each corresponding castle card and a goblin token on each portal, green side up. Set up the movement cards in the quest card deck and give the first player token to the first player. A game is played in five rounds, each round with a day and night phase. During the day phase, each player will move their heroes according to the movement card they select. Aggressive goblins make it harder to move or just stop your movement. If at the end of the move you've completed a movement quest, take the card and add a new quest to the board. If moving into temples or spell obelisks, you can learn or advance during the night time. If placing in a castle or grotto, follow the steps after the move. Flip the movement card over and the next player takes a movement turn. Repeat until four different movement cards have been used. In the night phase, each player will take a turn rolling the five dice and either taking damage, gaining power, fighting goblins, increasing their magic skill, learning spells, or advancing the temple quest according to the dice results. They can continue to roll in a pressure luck fashion until they're knocked out or they choose to stop. At the end of the night phase, you will move the magic mushroom tracker back to the first step of the magic tracker. Flip any remaining goblins from green to red and place new goblins on empty goblin po portals. Flip all movement cards to the active sides, move quests along and place new quests from the left side, then pass the first player token clockwise. The game ends after five rounds of play. Add up your points from the goblin, quests, and spell tracks, and whoever has the most points wins. This is a fantastic thematic strategy game in a small box that makes you feel like you're on a grand adventure. And that was Tiny Epic Quest. I hope you folks enjoy. And until next time, see you later. All right, folks, we are each week showing some stuff from the Board Game Geek store. Uh, our promos are available in the store, so keep that in mind, and we'll have more of our promos available in the store as time goes by. But this is some of their stuff, and I like looking at it. So these are Carcassonne maps, and I thought, oh, I already have these. But these are not the ones I've already taken a look at. These are the USA West and USA East. Now, they come rolled up, which is going to be problematic because... They're hard, you know, there's a couple things. It's hard to store them. If you store them rolled up, then you're going to, you know, each time you put them out on a board like this, you're going to have to put them under plexiglass or something. But, folks, if you have not played Carcass in a while, this will reinvigorate you for it because you have some starting tiles that you'll put out on the board, and then you'll build from those. There's already stuff on the board, and it has maps, and when you put something on the edge, it closes off. I've done a review of the other ones. There's a sheet of tokens that you'll use with it. I'm not sure. I'll have to look online to see what the rules are, but it has something to do with the tiles that go into those spots. But you'll see, like, here's a starting spot here and then you'll just build out from that here's another one down here so this one looks like it has two starting spots I really like this is one of my favorite ways to play Carcassonne and I'm interested in trying out these maps alrighty what else we got well we got a uh, oh uh, that's the thing to put on the back of your phone I forget what it's called uh, I had to beat oh here it is it's called a pop socket um, if you like pop sockets, I really don't. I don't know what the point of these are. Well, I shouldn't say that. My kids use them all the time. But there's one with the BGG logo. Also, there's a new BGG cup. Now, this is nice quality. Uh, though I drink more water than this, but I could just keep refilling it. If the more I have to walk to the water cooler, the better shape you'll be in. All right, let's talk about these, though. These are cubes for terraforming Mars. But if you can't tell, and you really can't tell from the video, these are metal they're really nice. I have them in my Terraforming Mars game, and there's just something, if you like metal coins, then you're going to like metal cubes. So you got the, the silvers, the coppers, and the golds, just for different uh, types, and that's for Terraforming Mars. And then finally, the last thing we're going to look at today is another promo for Sushi Party, or Sushi Go. Um, this is Saki. These three points 
That's all. Except the next hand, you have to choose the card without looking. <laughs> so it's very thematic. You know, like you drink sake, and next time you're like, just don't take any sushi, I don't care what. Which, you know, it's not necessarily a, I mean, it's bad, but it's not horrible. At least you get something. But, uh, yeah, I like these a lot. This is one I, I could see us using. So that's what I found in the Board Game Geek Store this week. <sighs> by Glenn Drover. You can still find some copies on the gig market. A game that we recommend for two players for many reasons. It's an amazing work and placement with so many twists. It's a unique blend of different mechanics, including a push-your-luck component. There is high interaction between players. You can declare war. There is area control to dominate the new world. Players compete over certain actions. Only the player with the most number of workers get to play that action. And the theme colonization, discovery, the new war is there throughout the entire game and tastefully done. Molly, how do you win this game? Well, I would say number one is dare to explore because the rewards are high. Um, push your luck. Two, uh, get ships because they act as wild cards that create sets of goods that make you money. Money, money, money! Yeah. <laughs> Uh, third is get as many workers as you possibly can because okay. uh, they every, every round because um, you need them. Yeah, it's the a game to which you need yes. workers. Yes. And lastly, uh, be the first one to get age three tiles because it can be a game changer. Oh, that's good. Thank you, Molly. Age of Empires, Age of Discovery, so many ages. Hi, I'm Tim. I'm Lizzie. And we are To Play or Not. To Play, a show about board games for two players. Whose tastes may differ. Good morning. Hello, welcome back to our top 10 games we like to play together. Get on. <laughs> Today we're at number five. Don't number touch me. Number five is. Don't touch me. I'll give you a hand. Oh, God, it's heavy. Small world. Big world. This is number five <laughs> because someone loves it. I love it. And someone really likes it. That's yeah, why, that's why it's number five. Yeah, I mean it'd be my number one or two, really, probably. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean this is a, a great dudes on a map sort of area majority uh, game. Very simple. It's a Days of Wonder game though, so it's a nice big sort of production. Hence, kind of being able to drag you into it because it is mm -hmm. nice to look at and play and stuff. Oh yeah. Um, and you enjoy it. Uh, I do really like it. Yeah, it's a nice game. It's very simple to play. The simple. concept of it. Simple is key. Yeah, yeah, me. yeah. <laughs> it plays very similar to Risk in a way, except there's one bit that's slightly different. Um, well, it's more than one bit that's slightly different, but <laughs> there's a bit in it that, where your race goes into decline. Oh, um, yeah. It's a weird thing. You need to really watch a whole kind of mm. uh, review about the game to find out what that means. It basically means that your race goes into limbo and you mm. choose another race. And the races are all kind of uh, randomly uh, set up at the beginning of the game because you mm -hmm. kind of shuffle together a, a special ability and then a race and you could have kind of uh, two completely yeah. random uh, And it's different things. every time as well. That's that's why I like it because it's like you're not playing the same game over and over again. Absolutely right, yeah. So you're not always going to have kind of flying yeah, uh, rats. You might have uh, <laughs> flying wizards. There are rats on there, aren't they? There are, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, I mean, yeah. And plus, we've, I mean, we've played this quite a few times and we've mm. never seen all the combinations, obviously, because no. there's thousands of them, really. Um, so, yeah, that concept alone is great. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, brilliant game. Very simple. Yeah, it looks good. I like the illustrations. All the yeah, bases, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So uh, definitely recommend this game, and it's our number five of the, the games we like to play together. Mm -hmm. So check out our review of this game to get more of an in-depth in uh, idea of what's going on, um, and check out our channel for some more top tens that we're just doing at the moment. Cool. Thanks for coming to see us on a breakfast. Enjoy the rest of the show. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Bye. 
All right, so what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Like I said, no matter what happens, we're going to still do a full slate of videos this week, but there are going to be a few changes. Um, today, I'll be still doing my Q&A at noon. In fact, when we're done here, Z is going to be doing a What's Happening later on, playing uh, Tides of Time. Is that what it was? Um, he'll be playing that at 10 o'clock. Turn the tide. Sorry. Something about tides. Uh, yeah, that's true. The other ones, they're very different games. Uh, he'll be playing at 10 o'clock directly after this. I'll be doing a Q&A at noon. And we got a few other uh, videos going up today. In fact, Chris is going to be doing On Mars for those of you who keep asking us to talk about it. Um, I got stuff going up tomorrow, but here's the big change. Tomorrow, because I might have to go sign a lot of papers, um, there will not be five more great games. And we're moving, and this makes me sad, we're moving Shoots and Marbles, but it's going to be on Thursday this week for all you Shoots and Marbles fans. Um, it's going to be at 2 p.m. on Thursday, Eastern Standard Time. Um, but there will be lots of reviews. Me and my kids will be reviewing a pile of party games. Uh, Roy and I will be playing after the Empire live on Wednesday. I'm reviewing some really good kids games this week. Quest Kids and or I'll be taking a look at the new Chronicles of Crime 1900. Uh, Street Fighter the Miniatures game. Some of you have been waiting to hear about that one. Mike's going to be taking a look at Burgle Brothers 2. Um, we have another design notes coming this week uh, with Kathleen Mercury. Um, I'm taking a look at the new Exit game with the puzzle pieces inside it, the Deserted Lighthouse. So a lot of cool things coming this week. So we have a full slate. I'll also be doing my top 10 games with automated movement later on this week. So keep an eye out for all that stuff. So hopefully you enjoy that. But then starting next Monday, other than Week in Review, there's going to be nothing for a while because we're going to be moving. Unless, of course, everything falls apart tomorrow, in which case I might be out searching for another studio. So either way... Uh, let's keep moving. Howdy folks, welcome to By the Numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason from the Family Showdown. On this episode of By the Numbers, I'm continuing my Through the Year series, my favorite, best game of Board Game Geek by year. Started way back in 1970, this time 2011. Take a look at the top five from 2011, which the number one game is The Castles of Burgundy. Coming in at number 15. Look at that list. The number one game is Burgundy. Number four, Trajan. I think I declare it the year of the Feld. The Castles of Burgundy is a dice placement game. You roll your dice, use them as workers to draft tiles. So it's a tile placement game as well. Many consider castles. I think that's what the cool kids call it. Castles, Steffenfeld's number one game, his best game. Now, this is held up by the fact that it is the number one ready game for Steffenfeld on Board Game Geek by quite a bit. You saw that Trajan, it's a little further down the list. Castles of Burgundy got a cool new shiny reprint in 2019, but I got the OG Castles of Burgundy, and we love it so much. We got these cool little bags. Take a look at the ratings, over 47,000 of them. We see lots of eights and higher for an overall rating of 8.1. Take a look at the weight, it comes at a 3.0, which makes it exactly, according to Board Game Geek and the voters for the weight, a medium weight game, a perfect 3.0. If you're looking to delve into the world of Feld games, Castles of Burgundy might be the first one for you or the new shiny new Castle of Tuxley, which is kind of based off Castle of Burgundy. One of those two might be the game for you. See you next time. All right. Well, today I'm talking a little bit about, well, the title here is Twin Films, and so I saw people were confused as what that means. If you look on Wikipedia, Twin Films are films with the same or very similar plot produced or released at the same time by two different film studios. So very, the most, I think, popular one of these, and they have a huge list on here, um, would be uh, Armageddon and um, Deep Impact came out around the same time. Although a bunch of, um, I, I know there was a couple Capote films that came out around the same time, and they got a lot of different things in here that you can, if you go look it up, they got Darkest Hour and Dunkirk, you know, they came out around the same time. This happens, there's no nefarious plot, no one's stealing movie plots, it's just a phenomenon that happens. But it also happens with games. Now with games, uh, a lot of games, 
sometimes it's because another game's popular and people will copy it and make more. And that happens too in movies. But sometimes similar games come out around the same time. One of the, the most interesting ones to me uh, was Carcassonne. So Carcassonne uh, came out a little bit after a game called Wooly Bully, which most people haven't played. And in fact, when I say it, you probably are already off in your own singing the song in your head thing. But Wooly Bully was like Carcassonne, except the, t the tiles had two sides. And when you would pull the tiles from the bag, you could pick which side went out. And you put them together, and it was about the sheep of different color and things like that. It was a good game, but it wasn't as strong as Carcassonne. They came out around the same time. One was clearly better than the other. The thing is, when games come out around the same time, we tend to criticize the lesser of them, right? Like, it's this, but that's no... Like, if someone had made a, a bird game in the past year, we would all said, no, not a bad game, but it's not Wingspan, right? And then there would be, of course, a few people who would champion the lesser game. But a lot of times, several games come out around the same time that are around the same theme, and it might be because that theme is popular in other subjects. Like, there's, there's no mistaking that superhero games now are very popular because, well, that Marvel Cinematic Universe is popular, so that affects that. And I worry sometimes that we tend to say there's too many of a game coming out because four or five came out over the course of a couple years. Like, I've been saying for a long time, there's tons of trading and meta-training games, there's tons of zombie, there's tons of generic fantasy, nowadays there's tons of generic space. There's a lot of games that are the same theme, whether it's building a castle or whatever. Uh, over the last, last week, I played a, a game with Z, another amusement park game. And I saw somewhere someone said, there's too many amusement park games. There's like five. <laughs> but, or maybe, there might be ten or whatever. But like five of them came out in the last couple years. And we feel like that's too many. First of all, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Yes, I gripe and yell about trading in the Mediterranean, but whatever. There's definitely, in my opinion, way too many train games, but whatever. If people like that themes, then hooray. I'm a big fan of new and unique themes. Like last year, I remember consumption. It was a theme about eating food and, and working off the food that you ate. That's a cool theme. And I wish more people would do that. But I also like the fact that people are exploring and making themes more interesting. We do top 10 lists on themes. And sometimes so many games come out. Like, for example, I did a few years ago, I did my top 10 pirate games. So many pirate games have come out in the last couple years, that list is essentially invalid at this point in time. I'm going to have to redo it at some point. And I think that that's, that's cool. It's good to see these themes come out. But I'm not going to, as much as I gripe and yell about it, I don't think we should hold it against it, especially if the theme is new. And I can't hold the success of a very popular game against another game that they just happen to so have the same theme. I don't know if any of that made sense, but it makes sense in my head. So that's what I was talking about today. Twin films, or sometimes twin games. Hi, I'm Ambie, and today I'm going to talk about Bargain Basement Bathysphere, which is a solo roll and write campaign game where you're exploring the depths of the ocean. In Bargain Basement Bathysphere, you're rolling dice to determine how many spaces you can go down into the ocean, and then you're trying to get back up to the surface without dying. Each game is a new sheet with new rules and different maps, but the basic rules are you have five dice that you start with and you roll them to determine your movement. You don't have to use all the dice, but for each die you roll, you have to move the entire movement of that die, either down or up, and you get to choose which way you're going for each die. There are spaces on the map that give you damage or stress or make you lose oxygen, which are all different ways that you can die and are bad for you. Whenever you pass one of these spaces, you have to take the damage or stress or oxygen, but if you land exactly on that space, you get to mark it off and you don't get any bad effects. So you want to go down deep to get good rewards, but you also want to use the die rolls in a good order so that you'll land on the bad spaces and not get as much bad stuff happen to you. And in order to re-roll your dice and move more, you'll have to spend an oxygen each time. So each turn you're spending oxygen and there's a timer and how long you can stay underwater. Furthermore, you'll be taking stress no matter what because whenever you pass a line, you get stress. And also, when you land on a space that's already marked, you get more stress. So when you're going back up, you have to make sure you try not to land on spaces that you've already land on previously on the way down. You also lose dice when you take some damage, so you'll be rolling fewer dice each turn and it'll be harder to get back up. So there's a, lot, a bit of press your luck in 
deciding how far down to go before you can go back up because you want to get the rewards, but also if you don't make it to the top, you won't get anything. I've only played through part of the campaign, but it gradually adds more rules each game. And each game is super exciting because you never know if you're going to make it out until the end. Bye! Today on the Plastic Canvas, we're turning the business penguin companion from ether fields from this into this in just two minutes. Hey everyone, Matt here from the Plastic Canvas and today on Two Minute Mini we are painting the Business Penguin Companion from Aetherfields. Now when I first got this game and was looking at all of the minis to try and work out which one to paint first, this was the mini that I was drawn straight to because it's a penguin with a top hat and a briefcase. Who doesn't want to paint that? So this was the first guy that I painted. And when I was painting the Business Penguin Companion, there were two main things that I focused on. The first was trying to build some texture in his feathers so that, that kind of stood out as everyone was sitting around the edge of the table. And the other was that while this penguin is not a fighter, he has been on lots of adventures. And so I tried to reflect that in a little bit of damage on his hat and his briefcase. So to do that damage, I did the same thing that I did with Hatchet, which was the previous two minute mini video, where I just used a bone color, did lots of lines and dots to look like scratch and scuff marks, and then put layers of wash over the top of that. Kept repeating that process so that the all those lines and dots showed through to different degrees to make it look like the aging had happened over a period of time. And then to bring out the texture in his feathers, I just put a black wash down over the base coat colors that I used. And then going back to the base coat color for both his back and his chest feathers, I just did lots of short, sharp strokes to try and bring out a bit of texture. And then gradually just lightened off the color that I was using. And for every layer as I was lightening it off, I just gradually reduced the amount of surface area. So by the final layer, I was only painting just the top of his back and the top of his chest to make it look like that that was under more light than any other area. So that finishes off our business penguin companion from Aetherfields. This guy was lots of fun to paint, not too complicated, but a penguin with a top hat and a briefcase. Had lots of fun with this one. So if you would like to see the full version of this video where I go through these steps in greater detail, you can head over to my channel, The Plastic Canvas. I hope you enjoy your breakfast. I think Ambi has convinced me to play that game. It looks really interesting. Anyhow, um, so we're looking here at this is I, I think it's on Kickstarter now from Elderwood Academy, but it's a little uh, keychain spell book. So I thought this was like a little interesting thing. I'm not going to do a whole review on it. I just thought I would talk about it here. So it's a little spell book here. You can see, oh, look, the elves carry this around or something. So it has these strong rare earth magnets in it that hold it in place, a little bit of cushion here on the one side, and then has these little cute dice in here. Now, as cute as these dice are, I don't particularly like them because you cannot read them at all. Um, as you, well, I mean, let's zoom in here. Oh, well, that's great zooming. All right, there, can you read them? Kind of barely. They're heavy little metal dice. So they all fit here in this, this container. So this is, this is something I would buy someone as a gift. Would I carry this on my keychain? No way. It's, it's too bulky, I think, to carry on your keychain stuff. I could see some people doing it, and hey, and now you always got dice with you. Um, I would probably want other little dice that I could read easier, even though I'm a big fan of little metal dice like this. Uh, I just these, these should have been inked white or something so that you could see them. But it's still a cool gift. This is something I would give to the RPG person who has everything. They likely don't have this. So that is um, the Keychain Spellbook from Elderwood Academy. You know, we're all fairly familiar with the concept of magnetic repulsion, where two magnetic objects held together at the same dipole will repel away from each other. Observe. But did you know that a similar yet far more dangerous force exists in nature and it could be sitting in your lap? Observe. Science. I love cats. 
but the game with the phonetically similar name from Frank West, I've never been quite so sure about. See, I've always felt that Isle of Cats was a confusing mess of ideas. Now, using fish to lure cats onto a boat, that makes good sense. But using those fish to buy treasure, or using those fish to buy other fish, or using those fish to buy seating arrangements for how the cats might go on your boat, always just kind of made this game stink like a communal litter box. Of course, the wife and daughter liked it, and so here it is. I forgot, however, that it had a solo mode, so to try and get a little more bang for my buck, I gave that a go. In Isle of Cats, the solo game, you play against a cardboard AI who claims to be your sister, and she'll start off with a deck of color cat cards, a deck of lesson cards, and a deck of action cards. Now, at the start of the game, you reveal her lessons, which she scores based on how you place your cats on your boat. At the start of each round, she'll reveal a color cat card. Now, she gets decreasing values of points for these based on which color cats you put on your boat. At the start of each turn, you'll reveal her action cards, the first of which tells you how many cats she's going to take, and from there on tell you which cats and which treasures she takes, and those simply come out of the game. Now, your rules and scoring stays the same, but that means that for every cat you pick up, you have to consider how many points she's going to get based on its color, how your placement of those cats may give her points based on her lessons, how your placement of those cats may give you points based on your lessons, and also don't forget, you're still trying to fill all the rooms. And in my experience, that's an awful lot to expect from a single cat. Playing I Love Cat solo takes an awful lot of patience, a good amount of luck, and a lot of effort. Kind of like filming this video using live action cats. Speaking of those finicky felines, now that the fur has finished flying, I probably need to go vacuum. Cheers. All right. Um, don't forget, Z's going to be on at 10 with an app so check it out we'll have like i said don't worry i'll be back at noon answer questions so it's gonna be a good week lots of cool stuff next week not maybe as exciting for you all but really exciting for us and again i'm hoping that you all get excited about the end product because we're really pumped about that um but either way thank you to all my contributors thank you to everybody who came on and watched me early here in the morning unless of course you're across the world in which case it's late at night um doesn't matter we appreciate you all. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.